This afternoon, um, with the cooperation of um, the Well County Coroner, the autopsy reports will be made available and become a public document. There are a few things that I want to talk about that you will see that are contained within those autopsy reports. Um, I'm going to be very general um, at this point. I hope you understand out of respect for the Rusick family who is still present. Um, part of the reason that we kept these sealed were for the following reasons. You will see in the autopsy report of Shanann Watts that forensic um, toxicology testing indicated that in spleen blood there was a blood alcohol level of 0.128. I want to be abundantly and very, very clear about this. This does not mean that she consumed alcohol nor that she was intoxicated. Um, we have consulted with the Well County Coroner's Office. We have cons conducted with the forensic experts at the Colorado Bureau of Investigation. To a person, they have all indicated to us that that blood alcohol level is very, very consistent with normal human decomposition based upon the location and the manner um, that Shanann and Nico's bodies were buried. Secondly, you will see in the autopsy reports of Bella and Celeste a number of different substances, I think is, is probably the way, Mr. Blush, that I want to address those. Um, we have had those examined by both um, expert chemists as well as the coroner's office because we wanted to make sure that all of those substances could be attributed to the crude oil and the water that their bodies were found in and nothing more. Uh, the forensic experts con uh, confirmed for us that all of the substances found in those toxicology reports are consistent with being submerged in unrefined crude oil. Watch any other comments you want to make about that at this point? Thank you. Um, other than that, I'm happy to take questions. Obviously, um, from our perspective, justice was more than served this morning. The defendant is now headed exactly where he belongs, which is a life sentence in prison without the possibility of parole. So I'm happy to take questions. Um, I'll, I'll certainly uh, call upon Mr. Blesch. Also, what I can tell you is that because of a whole host of reasons, not the least of which is we're not operating in, a, in the CSI TV world, oftentimes we can't determine exactly when um, or uh, a time frame for cause or, or time of death. Particularly, I think that that was complicated by where all of the different bodies were found and the amount of time that passed before their remains were recovered. I agree. Okay. So how much time? Well, we know that they were deposited in the locations where they were found in the early morning hours of August 13th. They were recovered on August 16th. That's, all, that's, that's the best I can tell you from a time. Hello, and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. There you heard the voice of Wald County District Attorney Michael Rourke, he was speaking at a press conference following the sentencing hearing on November the 19th, 2018. Now, I just want to emphasize that this is the first thing that he said. Before the media could really talk to him, he kind of wanted to be very explicit about the blood alcohol content in the autopsy reports, more specifically in the toxicology reports uh, related to Shanann Watts. And that and specifically what is found in the toxicology result was an ethanol result of 128 um, sorry, uh, blood alcohol concentration or BAC of 0 0.128 grams per 100 milliliters. And that was found in the spleen blood. That is part of the NMS Labs toxicology report for Shanann Watts. And this immediately raised a possible prosecution uh, hurdle. And that hurdle was that um, was this blood due to uh, alcohol consumption or was it due to normal decomposition? This is not going to be a very long episode. Uh, I can sort of anticipate that if you go into a lot of detail, people will start accusing you of things. So let me be explicit about the following. First of all, uh, I did my own independent study, both uh, of Shanann's Facebook, also of what people were saying, and also I spoke to a forensic scientist and had him run the numbers as well. And so independently, I came to the same conclusion that the district attorney came to, which is that 
the uh, toxicology numbers were normal. And uh, part of how uh, forensic science works is you are looking at the, the mathematics involved, how certain compounds build up over time, but you also want to know the circumstantial evidence. And so because of Shanann's active use of Facebook, one could get a sense to some extent of what Shanann was drinking during her last meals. And we can see when she was at in Arizona, you can see kind of there are a couple of photos of her with uh, the table in front of her and, and sometimes a glass in front of her. And invariably, those do look like glasses of water. So just to be very clear and very obvious and very unambiguous about it, the true crime, true crime rocket science position on Shanann Watts is that um, she didn't drink alcohol, she didn't consume alcohol, um, and the amounts found in a toxicology report were um, normal given the length of time that she was um, uh, left at Survey 319 before her body was retrieved. Okay, so I hope that that part is explicit. Now, what I'm going to say now, and I, and I hope I'm going to be, I hope um, I'm being very, very clear when I say this. If Chris Watts didn't take the plea deal, if Chris Watts had a defense lawyer, if Chris Watts had a really good defense lawyer, and if Chris Watts had sort of twiddled his thumbs and come up with a scenario. So this is a defense case. This is a legal argument that I'm making hypothetically. I'm not trying to argue that this is the case. I'm trying to say that the... Uh, prosecutors, law enforcement had to, um, how can I put it, they had to check that this possibility could be defended. And one of the things they did was they went and interviewed people. So they went to investigate the possibility that Shanann may have consumed alcohol. So there was a, Detective Baumhofer and others went and spoke to people after, afterwards and checked specifically on this, this issue. So it wasn't a non-issue. It was, it was definitely a real issue. And now I'm going to play devil's advocate and just say what could possibly have happened quite briefly if Chris Watts didn't take the plea deal, if, it had, if he'd had time to come up with a nefarious scenario. In other words, a fiction, fiction scenario where he would try to put the blame on Shanann, victim blame her and make himself innocent. And one of the ways that he could potentially have done this is by highlighting what do, does look like a elevated uh, blood alcohol level um, and say that she was drinking. And if uh, you take that um, particular statement, then you can kind of see because she was pregnant, you, you, you already make the making the inference that she was reckless. She was reckless in terms of um, the baby that she had. She was um, erratic in terms of her, her moods or whatever. In any event, that would be the, the case that the defense would try to make against Shanann, trying to argue that Shanann was the cause of the argument or something like that. Does that make sense? Now, again, let me just be explicit. That's not something I believe happened. I'm saying... It's something that the defense could weaponize potentially to use to their own advantage. Now, although I don't believe Shanann drank on the, um, on the flight or, or in Arizona, uh, although I don't believe that's the case, I just want to highlight two texts that she sent where she said um, she needed a drink. And now, once again, let me be explicit. I'm not saying these texts prove that Shanann did drink or that she had an elevated blood alcohol. I'm saying a cynical defense, um, a defense team could seize upon these texts and say, well, there's some doubt. They could try and make that argument. 
I don't think a jury would believe that argument, but they nevertheless could seize on this. And so on uh, Sunday, August the 5th, so this is when she was still in North Carolina, this was the day before Watts went to visit his family, she wrote to a friend of hers saying, I need a glass of wine. Okay, that doesn't mean she had a glass of wine. She simply said, I need a glass of wine. But this text could be taken out of context and, as I say, used by the defense. Another text is, was written a little bit later. I uh, beg your pardon, a little bit earlier. It was written on Friday, August the 3rd, where she said, I need a stiff drink. So there are two references in the two weeks prior to her death where she spoke about wanting to drink alcohol and again it doesn't mean she did drink alcohol it just meant that she texted that now just something else to as a way of potentially interpreting the toxicology is that the toxicology um, de defines the compound found in Shanann's blood as two things, ethanol or blood alcohol concentration. And they, they're essentially the same thing. But what I want to emphasize is ethanol is also a compound found in the oil industry. And this is what made me wonder whether this, this um, blood alcohol concentration or ethanol concentration wasn't something that was induced due to strangling Shanann with a rag soaked in ethanol, if that makes sense, or even a rag soaked in pure alcohol. In other words, something that, as what strangled her, he put a rag in front of her mouth so that when she inhaled, she would far quickly um, uh, sort of lose consciousness and lose the ability to function than she otherwise would. And we know that Ordinarily, oil workers that are exposed to gas fumes can uh, have similar difficulties. Um, it can affect balance, it can affect the coordination, and it can even lead to loss of consciousness in large enough doses. And since Chris Watts worked in that oil, in, since Chris Watts worked in the industry, wouldn't he have been painfully aware of these chemicals? So that was certainly just something that I considered as well. I'm not going to talk about the toxicology reports for the children, but what I will do is I will follow this up with a um, analysis of the autopsy reports. And uh, obviously, if this is the kind of information that um, you might feel is of a sensitive nature, then I would recommend you don't uh, watch the video. There obviously won't be any images of the victims, but the material itself might be a bit unsettling. So if it's the kind of thing you you think would make you feel queasy, then uh, probably best to just avoid it completely. So what I'll be doing is the crime scene analysis um, of Dave Yoakum, his narrative, that'll be following up this video and then following that video will be the uh, autopsy reports. Thank you for listening. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do like, share, leave a comment and I'll see you guys next time.